Good morning and thank you for joining us here on Face the State. I'm Tracy Townsend. We start with a goodbye message from U.S. Senator Rob Portman. After more than three decades of public service, including in both chambers of Congress, Portman will retire at the end of the year. He was first elected to the Senate in 2010. He was born in Cincinnati and lives there with his wife. This week he made this goodbye speech on the Senate floor. In my Senate office, as these folks behind me uh, can recite, uh, we have a mission statement and we developed it uh, together and it says the following, our mission is to deliver bipartisan results through effective servant leadership with integrity, selflessness and excellence so all Ohioans can reach their God-given potential. What is servant leadership? I think it begins with the respect for constituents by listening to them and understanding their concerns and then whenever possible delivering those results for them from casework to legislation. During my time in the Senate, I'm proud of what we've been able to accomplish for Ohio and the country by trying to follow that formula. I'm told by my staff today that as of this week, over the past 12 years, there are 195 bills that I have authored or co-authored that have been signed into law. After Portman's farewell speech, several Senate colleagues offered remarks, including Senator Amy Klobuchar. Rob, we're going to miss you so much, uh, but just as John said, I have a feeling uh, that this is not your last act and that along with Jane and your wonderful family, there'll be much more to come. J.D. Vance will take over Portman's seat. We do wish Senator Portman the best of luck. He has been a friend of Face the State, and we certainly wish him well in this next chapter of his life. The motion is adopted. And with that, the Respect for Marriage Act will go to the president's desk. The House passed the bill with a vote of 258 yeas, 169 noes. Every Democrat voted in favor of the bill, along with 39 Republicans. Four Ohio Republican lawmakers are in that group. Mike Carey, Anthony Gonzalez, David Joyce, and Michael Turner. It now moves to the president's desk. The Senate passed it last month. Senator Sherrod Brown says this is a huge victory even though, you know, a third of the members of Congress uh, voted against it. I don't understand why anybody says that, that people can't marry the person they love. I don't, I don't care who they are. If they want to establish a legal relationship, more power to them. It brings more stability and happiness to our society. Um, I don't understand the opposition. So I'm for anything that gives people that security and that freedom. I don't understand people standing in the way of it. Ohio lawmakers continue to push through several bills as the lame duck session continues, including one that would strip the powers and authority of the people you elected to the State Board of Education. This week, the Ohio Senate passed Senate Bill 178. It's a bill that would take control from an elected state board and give it to the governor's office. The board has been facing criticism over issues including low student test scores and high absentee rates over the past year. This bill would eliminate a state superintendent who's elected by the State Board of Education and allow the governor to appoint a director and two deputies to oversee curriculum and implementation of new laws. The board would still keep control over licensing and territory transfers. We've got massive problems, not minor ones, not ones that need to wait a year, not ones that need to wait two years, not ones, uh, we, we've got to act now. Critics of this legislation worry that the general public would have less say in their child's education if the decisions were made by the governor's cabinet. When asked about this bill, Governor DeWine didn't have much to say. I told the speaker that I think it's very important. It now goes to the Ohio House. It's unclear if or when it will be made a priority. But at the end of the year, the legislative session ends, which means bills that haven't passed will expire. 
The distracted driving bill hasn't made it out of Senate committee. Under this legislation, drivers could be pulled over by police in some cases solely for holding or using a cell phone while driving. Republican Senate President Matt Huffman said he is not in favor of the bill, but would allow it to come to a vote if fellow Republican lawmakers overwhelmingly show support. Governor DeWine says the bill is a step forward in making Ohio roads safer. Look, it's not perfect, uh, but but let's keep in mind that this has been stalled in the legislature for a long, long, long time. So if we can get it uh, moving, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm someone uh, who, who's always uh, willing to, uh, uh, you know, to take a, a victory and uh, get started down a pathway. Uh, you know, if we can get this passed. I think it's good. Uh, it sends a signal to people uh, that distracted driving uh, is is very, very dangerous. Uh, I think we will then have the opportunity to come back in the future and uh, uh, let, let's say uh, get rid of some of the rough edges of the, of, the, of the bill. The Ohio House passed a bill that would make swatting calls a felony to committee. Swatting pranks take emergency services away from where they're really needed. Under House Bill 462, those convicted could face prison time, fines, and restitution. The money would be used to reimburse law enforcement for abusing emergency services. This now moves on to the Senate. Democrats in Ohio are calling voters to action. They say to stop a bill from moving forward by the end of the year. It is a solution in search of a problem. There is no need for this bill whatsoever. We don't have issues and problems. That's Representative Richard Brown talking about House Bill 294. This bill centers around voting processes, and Democrats say it will only make voting harder, not easier. The bill would shorten the time for early voting and cut the amount of time absentee ballots are available. It also proposes increased security at drop boxes and a ban on August special elections. And finally, it would require IDs to indicate when a person is not a U.S. citizen. Democrats are asking voters to call on their local representatives to express their thoughts about that particular bill. Several bars in the capital city are one step closer to not being able to sell liquor. We'll talk about why Columbus City Council voted to pull their licenses. And her days on council are almost up. I sat down with Elizabeth Brown to look back on her career and what's coming next. Welcome back. It was a big week for Columbus City Council. Members tackled liquor licenses, minimum wage, food carts, and gun control. We'll start there. Council unanimously voted to pass what city council members are calling common sense gun laws. Council President Shannon Harden says this is a huge step forward in eliminating violence from the streets. The reform will prohibit ordinary residents from owning large capacity magazines with 30 or more rounds of ammunition. It will also prohibit reckless selling, lending, giving, or furnishing a firearm to anyone who is prohibited from possessing one. It also prohibits a person from negligently storing a firearm in a place that might be accessible to minors. City Council member Shayla Favor says this will be enforced on the streets and she's confident in this legislation taking advisement from City Attorney Zach Klein. For me, this is worth the risk. Protecting our residents, protecting our youth is worth the risk of a potential lawsuit. Uh, we want to make sure that we're doing everything we can to keep residents safe. City Council also voted to strip 12 of the 13 liquor permit renewals for local businesses that were believed to have chronic criminal activity, including crime, overdoses, and liquor violations. The list includes Dollhouse, Platform Lounge, Queen of Hearts, and Julep. A particular concern to me with Julep are, number one, unchecked underage drinking, excessive noise, littering, vandalism, fighting. What we're doing now is trying to make sure that we move forward in a better light so that way people are safe and that we can avoid that situation from happening again and to also de-escalate situations as well. You might remember it was outside of Julep where 37-year-old bartender Gregory Coleman Jr. was sucker punched and later died. His sister, Glenna Coleman, tells 10TV's Ashley Bornanson, these measures are one small step toward accountability. We're just thankful. We're thankful that people are going to be held accountable um, across the board, and, and we believe that everyone should be held accountable. Glenn A. Coleman says this season has been one of the hardest of her family's life, accepting they will never see her brother, 
37-year-old Gregory Coleman Jr. again. We had our first holiday without my brother. Uh, we have more holidays coming. It's unimaginable. It's just a pain that our family will never get over. Glenay says she believes shutting down establishments like Julep will help ensure safety on our streets. Shutting someplace like this down, along with the many other places that are just dangerous to Columbus, is a step forward in making Columbus a safer place and a safer environment so people can go out, have a nice night, and not have to worry about things like this happen. City Attorney Zach Klein says the city zeroes in on businesses that have excessive dangerous activity to ensure public safety. We look at, you know, the police runs, the data, the shootings, the stabbings, uh, and a lot of it is also complaint driven, whether it's our work in our neighborhoods with nuisance abatement lawsuits and drug houses or the objection to liquor license. According to the city of Columbus, there have been 93 calls of service to Julep in the past two years, 40 calls in 2021, 53 in 2022. These calls include responses to shots fired, sex crimes, people with guns, OVI, assaults, fights and disturbances. A spokesperson for Julep says they are taking steps to make the area a safer place. It's making sure that we do four pat downs. We have four people on the doors at all times and people inside of the building as well. As for the Coleman family, Glen A says they appreciate the community support and would like to see more thorough vetting of security at local bars to make sure nothing like this ever happens again. I think that they need to understand who they're hiring. Um, and there needs to be background checks that are completed, that are followed up on, um, and that are done correctly. That was Ashley Bornanson reporting. City Council's vote, really just the first step in this process. Zach Klein says next his office is going to bring the cases to the state's Liquor Control Commission, where a final decision will be made as to whether they are permanently going to lose their liquor licenses. Targeting liquor licenses isn't the only way the city is trying to curb violence. This week, City Council had a public hearing on some legislation targeting food carts. The goal is to reduce the hours food carts can operate from 3 in the morning until 2 in the morning in order to cut down on late night crime. And hopefully everybody walks away feeling heard, absolutely heard, and that we come up with a product that is um, something that the community can live with, both the residents, the businesses, and then, of course, the food cart vendors themselves. Assistant Health Commissioner. Council member Emmanuel Remy says the next step is to draft final legislation based on the feedback they've received from these public hearings. They do hope to present that early next year. This busy week for council comes as one of its members is getting ready to start a new job. Elizabeth Brown served seven full years on Columbus City Council and is now making a change. Brown is taking on a new title. She has the new title of CEO, president of the YWCA. And you may remember that she'd just given birth two weeks before her first election. She told me in our sit down interview this week that at that time she had no idea what she was doing as a mother or as a candidate. It was, she says, the beginning of a lot of learning. And I will always remember um, she was in my rap, right? Um, she and my husband and I went to the election night party, and when the votes were tallied and, and I won, um, I walked out on stage and I had her on me. And she was eight days old, I want to say, something like that. Two and a half weeks so old. Um, and say, she slept the through phrase, the whole thing. Like All the cheers, me yelling into a microphone. And, um, you know, that was back I when I was naive enough to think that, like, babies do sleep, sleep a lot, because that changed. <laughs> <laughs> so um, when you think back to that, the night that you won, um, how would you describe your tenure on Columbus City Council? Well, you know, I said this last night when I was talking to my colleagues. I, when I won and I walked in to City Hall doors and got sworn in, I was really in awe of everything that we can accomplish here. And I honestly leave almost exactly seven years later, equally in awe of what can be done here. So we passed the city's first ever paid family leave policy. We established the first ever incentive for businesses to hire restored citizens, really baked into our purchasing agreements. Um, we also established um, the first ever living wage for um, job creation projects that the city pursues. So at the time it was $15 an hour, and we put in there a requirement to review that wage 
which was really beautiful because last night that review came up and we raised it to today's living wage. Um, and it's a reminder of how important that kind of thing is in governing because with inflation and other things, $15 an hour doesn't mean what it did seven years ago. These are the budget books. So I um, have chaired um, the, the council budget processes for six years. And it's really some of my favorite work that we've done. Budgets? The budget. Because the key to everything is the budget, right? Do you, if, if you um, say you value something, where does it live in the budget? Um, and I've been able to see the money, follow the money, and also try to demystify the process for constituents. I love the energy as you're describing all of this. I'm just going to be very blunt. Why are you leaving? <laughs> <laughs> I love that question. Um, I am leaving because I've done so much here, and I actually see the way that the work we do here really functions at its best with awesome community partners in the community. Um, and I want to do that community work in a different way. New leadership, leadership is coming to the state's largest school district. Dr. Talisa Dixon announced that she's going to retire at the end of the school year. Superintendent Dixon wrote in a letter that this was not an easy decision, but it was time to move on. She served as superintendent of Columbus City Schools for the last three and a half years. A spokesperson with the Columbus Education Association told 10TV's Richard Solomon that she believes teachers and parents deserve a say in who's next. The parents have been with us through this whole ordeal with the strike, with, with everything. Um, so we've seen it all. And I think that it is only fair and it's only right that they make sure that they include um, all parties in the selection process. Here now is a look at Dixon's time with CCS. From 2001 to 2010, she served as an administrator at Brookhaven High School and at Columbus Alternative High School, commonly known as CAUSE. She started the superintendent role in March of 2019. She created the Department of Engagement. We will certainly keep you posted every step of the way in the search for a new superintendent of Columbus City Schools. This week, Columbus City Council could put a ban on flavored tobacco. We'll talk about why the mayor says it's a move that will save lives and why the school board is backing the ban. Plus, major changes could be on the way for the Ohio State Fairgrounds. We'll take a look at the plans the governor hopes to make reality. We have an update on the summer power outage that left thousands of AEP customers without power. PJM, the company that monitors the flow of electricity and that ordered AEP to shed power to avert a massive electrical shutdown, explained what lessons it learned from the outage. And they say AEP needs to do a better job clearing tree branches along electrical lines. And more training, they say, is needed on what to do in that type of situation. The Ohio Consumer Council took issue with the findings because it came from AEP, not from an independent review. Really, I think we need to find some more details. And I don't know if PGM is not necessarily the one to do that. I think that needs to go towards uh, AEP to release some information. And if they can't release information, moving that up to the PUCO to, to start a formal uh, investigation of this, uh, of this outage. An independent federal review is expected next month. Six months after the storm, the PUCO has yet to conclude its investigation into what caused that power outage. The strategy is simple. Hook them while they're young and get a customer for life. Well, that simply cannot stand in our community. The effort to ban flavored tobacco products in the city of Columbus is gaining steam. Top local leaders gathered to put on a united front. And these leaders say this is all about public health and equality. As 10TV's Brittany Bailey reports, they hope this creates a domino effect throughout the state. The past four years of my high school career with all just nicotine-based issues and things have been pretty detrimental to my education, actually. Frankie Midoski is only a high school senior, but she's already taking a stand on a community problem. She says vaping is an epidemic among her peers. It's just encouraged. It's on social media, like everybody on our TikToks, everybody on our Instagrams. They're all encouraging that vaping is like this cool behavior when actually it really isn't, and there's severe health risks. She joined Columbus City and health leaders on Wednesday to send a unified message that flavored tobacco should be banned in the city. There's nothing 
nothing acceptable about an industry that willfully preys on the safety and well-being of our community to prop up their profit margins. Mayor Ginther's message comes as the Columbus City Council is debating legislation that would ban the sale of flavored tobacco, including menthol cigarettes in the city. Columbus Public Health Commissioner Dr. Mishika Roberts says this legislation falls in line with the city's past efforts to declare racism a public health crisis and do something about it. Flavors are used to hook kids as well as minority communities on nicotine. And nicotine is very, very addicting. But not everyone is supportive of this effort. Public hearings on this have drawn large crowds of business owners and others who worry about the negative economic impact. We think this, this is something where we can work together uh, and we can figure out ways to support these businesses moving forward when they're not targeting African Americans uh, and young people in our community. 10TV's Brittany Bailey reporting there. This week, Columbus City School Board of Education is passing a resolution to support the ban. Here's why. I saw this as an important thing to highlight for our board, and we share the sentiment that flavored tobacco, flavored nicotine products being sold to children is dangerous. It's, it's something that is also distractive. It's something that disrupts not only their lives, health-wise or otherwise, but also in the academic space. The mayor of Bexley tells us his city council is also working on similar legislation that Columbus City Council is considering. We'll monitor this, keep you updated on both of those potential bans. The capital city is pushing to put nature first, and a well-known face is leading that charge. The Rapid Five collaboration includes Morpsey, the Urban Land Institute of Columbus, and Franklin County Parks. The founding board of directors met for the first time this week. The board is made up of 16 people representing the community from art, real estate, design, and more. And they are led by Dr. Amy Acton. With this next generation that is so, so interested in being outdoors, so interested in both the adventure side of it, but also the peace of mind it brings. Science has been done that shows that states of awe and wonder are actually something that's incredible for our mental health. And I know for myself, you know, going places like Chestnut Ridge, this little undiscovered park, being out there for half an hour, just I, I can feel everything change for me. And we want all of our citizens to have access to that. What's beautiful about our waterways is they are within a mile's reach of every neighborhood, every neighborhood. And before long, we've already had Appalachia wanting to connect up to Franklin County. Delaware is naming some of their new park systems Rapid Five. So we realize that we have an opportunity to create a park system that reaches this entire region, over 4 million people. The founding board will officially convene in March of 2023. Now, the governor has big plans for the state fairgrounds. Governor DeWine's plan includes changes that he says aren't set in stone. The proposal includes putting a town square on the grounds, renovating and demolishing existing buildings, adding parking garages, and installing a new entertainment pavilion. We have to look at this fair as something for all Ohioans. Every single Ohioan should be able to walk on the state fairgrounds and find something that they really love and get excited about and are inspired by. These changes would happen during the course of several years and funding not quite locked in just yet. Well, we certainly thank you for joining us here on Face the State today, and we do wish you a terrific week. Take care.